Hi, everyone. Uh, last talk of the conference. I'm not sure about how, what's the energy uh, kind of levels like, but let's do this. So, a bit about myself. I've been doing search for a long time, uh, over a decade now. Uh, pretty much been dabbling with Lucene and Solar all this while. Uh, and I've built a few search platforms at organizations, big and small startups. Uh, yeah. And more importantly, I've been just involved with Lucene and Solar for a while now. And before we start, uh, because I've been involved with solar, uh, the talk kind of uh, pivots on solar and stays with solar, but you could use most of the, these, these concepts or questions or suggestions for uh, any form of search, search platform that you might want to build. Like you might be using another technology, maybe Elasticsearch, and you could just use the same things. So search engine, as we know, right? Uh, that's how a regular search, search setup looks like when you're just building a stand up, uh, standalone search platform, and say a distributed search. Uh, you have a bunch of nodes. You have a coordination service. Uh, in case of Solar, it's Zookeeper. Uh, you have a bunch of clients who try to talk to your nodes. So there's a lot of communication going on. It's already kind of um, complicated enough. I would certainly call it non-trivial, for sure. Um, but then, what's the difference between that and a search platform, right? I mean, you have a bunch of nodes, you have coordination services, it's a distributed setup, you could have multiple collections, whatever you want. Um, how, how would a search platform be different to begin with? Well, a search platform essentially would be when you have a ton of tenants or a ton of users, related or unrelated, trying to use the same platform while one person or one organization or one group kind of owns that platform, takes care of most of their heavy lifting stuff. So you might have those three users here or three groups that are using this uh, right there, logged in and everything, and you might have services running for you for the benefit of you know, uh, consolidating Okay. Okay. consolidating um, the, the administration of the platform itself. So you might have an, admi uh, an admin interface, a backup service, monitoring service, health check, uh, and a bunch of other stuff. So while that's the difference, why do you really need a platform, right? Um, you could do pretty much the same kind of stuff using separate standalone setups, uh, and uh, every team could have their own thing, or every user could set things up by themselves. But um, as said earlier, right? I mean, search is a non-trivial task. Uh, when I got started with search, not even distributed, when I just got started with search, it took me a reasonable amount of time to set things up. Now, uh, things have gotten much better in terms of uh, usability and being able to spin up something and try it out. Um, but if you really wanted to take it to a production level setup, like a setup that you could rely on, could uh, real life users on there, uh, you would really, uh, I would say, put in anywhere between a few weeks to a few months to, to get there, right? So you really want to make it easier to set up search for multiple users. Uh, instead of everyone spending a few months, you might want to be the person who actually does that for them so that they could just, at the press of a button, start up instances, not really worry about hardware, manage, managing the entire thing, um, security, privacy, everything else. And we're going to talk more about all of that later on. And while you make all of those, which is make things trivially easy, make, them, make repeatable tasks uh, right there at the press of a button, um, it basically means uh, you're making things cost effective because uh, the months are now gone and shrunk to a few hours. But while everyone might be super excited about, oh, we could build a search platform, most companies, most organizations generally have uh, you know, multiple teams trying to use search for different use cases. And so uh, there are times when everyone has their own setup and uh, they learn the same things and they work in isolation. Um, but uh, more often than not, it kind of converges into uh, having an idea or that moment of, oh, we should probably have just one platform that would cater to every, each of these teams. Or uh, in terms of external users, just think about, uh, we could have a service that the real world users could use to set up search. I mean, I, you could have something like uh, AWS Cloud Search, uh, where you could spin up an instance and start off with search without having to worry about uh, setting up things for you. But while you do that, uh, there are certain questions that you should ask yourself um, or ask as a group in terms of uh, 
what do these questions or what does the platform mean to me? What am I trying to build here? So the first question there would be, who is the user? That's a very basic question. It's super important to understand as well, right? So I generally would uh, distribute or differentiate the users on those two uh, of parameters, I would say, or in those two categories, it's internal or external. Um, and it kind of has a fuzzy in between, but if you look at internal or external, internal users is when, you have, you, when you're an organization, you have a bunch of teams, you have a bunch of groups that need to use a platform so that they don't have to reinvest the same effort uh, into the same effort. Uh, I would call them as internal users, and I'll tell you why. Uh, external users would be something, again, like AWS Cloud Search or some, some service that you're selling to the outside world for, for users to use and put user data and use it for their own apps or websites or whatever it is that they're doing. The difference here would be um, internal users tend to work much better with you. Uh, an example being in terms of logs, you might be able to share logs with more co uh, comfort or more convenience uh, with your internal users only because you know uh, their intentions are hopefully okay when you share logs with them which have IP addresses and stuff like that, uh, as opposed to external users. Uh, let's say they have uh, a crashing JVM. Now, if you have a multi-tenant setup, you, you wouldn't really want to share a bunch of things, a bunch of information about a multi-tenant setup with those, those people, right? So uh, kind of totally is, is going to be a starting point in terms of how do you start thinking about your platform. It, totally changes the game. Uh, you need to figure out who are you targeting uh, when you're trying to build a search engine. That brings us to where in the pyramid is the user, right? Uh, I try to bring things into or put all search use cases into something like that, uh, that kind of a pyramid, or search users into that kind of a pyramid. Uh, you've got the basic users who've got a bunch of data. All they want to do is have a single box search, and that's it. They're not really bothered about much stuff. Then you've got the intermediate uh, users, which is most of the users, because they're users who are, who are looking at you know, things like interesting query parsers. They're looking at uh, uh, analysis chains, uh, uh, an indexing pipeline. Um, so a bunch of interesting stuff, mostly configurable. So it's easy, but they're trying to do more complicated things. And at the top of the pyramid would be the advanced users, which um, I would say they need custom plugins. They have code that they write, and they want that to be a part of your search service. Um, and when you're, again, designing a search platform, I would suggest that you kind of target one or at the most two of these. And when I say two, you shouldn't be targeting the top and the bottom of the pyramid. That's a bad, bad idea. You should be looking at uh, either the top two or the bottom two. Uh, the, bottom, the middle tier, as I said, kind of spreads vast. So there's a lot that can go on there. And the reason why you wouldn't want to do that is because the expectations and uh, things that are needed for a basic user are completely different as compared to an advanced user. That, um, talking about the interaction, now you know about the user, you know where, what category does the user fall in, you know uh, the, the user, uh, the, the kind of use cases that you should be expecting. Uh, an important thing there is, uh, what kind of an interaction, how would this interaction happen between the user who's trying to talk to your search platform? And first thing, repeat to yourself, customer APIs cannot change. Um, all of us tend to create platforms, software, apps, whatever, uh, especially when you're building a, something like a platform which other developers are going to use and going to build on top of, you do not want to change APIs. You really don't want to do that because one, they wouldn't change their APIs when you want them to. Two, that means you would have to support the older APIs and the newer APIs. So you really, don't want, you really want to think about two things here, the endpoint and the APIs in terms of the client, the rest endpoint, everything there. So spend a ton of time, think about how this can work, and make sure that everything that you're building is future-proof. Uh, so you don't have to change things um, six months later or a year later. And as I said, because you'd have to run multiple versions if you had to support multiple uh, APIs, being stuck with old versions is painful. Like, in my experience, it's probably the worst thing that you can do to yourself. So what's generally needed here, right? Um, when, when you think about APIs, when you're thinking about what to do, you want uh, restriction of requests. You want safeguarding of your system. Um, one thing that I always believe in is when you're building a, a platform, forget about a search platform, 
users are hostile. It's funny to say that, but most users are all, you, you should just assume that all your users are hostile in terms of, um, they're not there to help you keep this platform healthy and happy. They're there to literally pee the hell out of that system and make sure that it comes down one fine day. And what you really are trying to build here is to safeguard your system so that nobody is able to really do that. The second thing is abstraction of Zookeeper, which is more of a solar thing, but uh, customers don't really need to know about it. I, I really think customers don't, should ever, shouldn't ever know about it. So um, you want to abstract out Zookeeper uh, so that they only know about how to use search, not really about the inner details about how things work. Um, you want a throttle request, something that's not provided out of the box with, it, with at least solar. So you want to do stuff like that. Um, you want to fail fast for unsupported features. Uh, one other thing that you really want to do is you don't want to ever put out solar out there, build a platform on top of it, and expose everything that solar offers to the end users. Trust me, it's not going to end up too well. It's going to be a disaster, pretty much. Um, and the last thing that you really want is stable API. As I said, uh, you don't want things uh, that break back compatible. Solar kind of, uh, we are kind of infamous that we do that uh, reasonably often. So one good idea of, uh, of providing an interact, a way to interact for users is to just use Solar Client and let them, let them just use the same client that is offered by Solar. Um, well, the good part about that is uh, you don't have to write a bunch of documentation. People can just look up snippets on the internet and write, build on top of that. Uh, and it's easy to add custom features. There are things that stop you from actually using that. And the reason for that is the reason why you would build a search platform over providing or letting people set up their own search service, like it would be easy to just help people bring up their solar cluster without having to build a platform around it. Um, but that takes away everything that you're trying to achieve here. And so uh, you don't really want to offer solar client either for exactly the same reasons. You want to build a custom client that builds on top of or wraps around a solar client maybe. So you retain the APIs, but abstract out everything or remove everything that, that are unsupp that's unsupported. So you restrict features. You try and ex not expose Zoo uh, Zookeeper, uh, but uh, the, cl the solar cl cloud solar client requires you to, to do that. Um, and there are a bunch of experimental APIs, which you really don't want to expose. So, and with the amount of flux, Cloud Solar Client exposing directly that as your client uh, interaction medium uh, is a disaster, I would say. So, think about a wrapped client. Think about a client that wraps things and makes that would make things much better. Also, if um, if you guys have tried or used Solar, you don't want named lists to come back in your responses. So, yeah, that's that's the other thing you could change. And a good idea to do, a good way to do that is adding a proxy layer in the middle. And I'm going to talk more about why do you need that, but I really think a proxy layer in the middle kind of solves a lot of these problems, like uh, making it easy, uh, controlling with the throttling part, and a bunch of other things. So that brings us to um, now we know how to set things up. We know what the user wants to do. We know how the user is going to use or interact with the service. What about managing the clusters? Um, Service generally can be divided into two broad categories, delegated and self-servicing. And um, you generally want to, um, they have a bunch of, they have like a fair bit of overlap. That, that's where the sweet spot is. Um, if you really look at self-servicing, self-servicing is something which is meant for the advanced user. Um, the, uh, the user gets notifications, gets metrics, gets information about what's going on in the cluster, and ha is responsible and has endpoints and access uh, and has ways to access the cluster to go ahead and make changes to the cluster. So manage the cluster themselves um, is, is self-servicing. Delegated, on the other hand, is when things auto-scale. So you go ahead and the, 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 the user brings up the cluster, and then everything happens magically. Like, yes, that's the thing. Um, or, so a lot of people think. The sweet spot in the middle is when you kind of have an overlap between both. There are things that you do yourself, and then there are things that you allow the user to do. One um, is discussing this yesterday. Um, 
about how people can shoot easily um, in their own foot uh, when, you when you allow them to do so is imagine a use case where a user um, is allowed to auto scale, say, and add a replica because uh, they're anticipating a bunch of traffic. Uh, but your system's also configured to automatically figure out what the right or the correct replication factor is. And um, so here's a user who manually sends a request, says, oh, add a replica. I know there's more requests coming in. So boom, there's a, re there's a replica co that comes up. But the system says, I don't think that's the right replication factor, brings it down. So you've got a confusion here, because the human being's trying to do something totally different than what the system thinks is right. And so when you offer like a combination of self-serviced and delegated uh, management service, make sure people don't overstep on, each other, on the abilities and capabilities and responsibilities of what they're supposed to do. But um, that was the part about, uh, I forgot, uh, managing the cluster. And, uh, but you can only manage the cluster if you can monitor it, right? I mean, if you don't know what's going on, you can't really manage a cluster. You don't have any, you need insights, right? So you need to expose things. And because the sweet spot was right in the middle of being managed and delegate, uh, self-serviced and delegated, uh, you don't really want to expose everything. One, that confuses your end users, so that's a bad thing. Uh, two, uh, they might end up doing or shooting themselves in the foot way too often if you tell them too much. So don't tell them everything. Tell them only the, the, the side of things where they can actually do something actionable. So uh, let's say they changed um, their schema that does not confirm to their documents that are coming in anymore. So that's something that you can't fix, right? So when you have something of that come up, your monitoring system says, oh, I've seen a bunch of failed document uploads. Send that to the end user. Tell the end user to fix the schema because there have been 20,000 update failures in the last 15 minutes. So send those kind of uh, send, uh, share that kind of information. Don't share the kind of information that the system is supposed to know and act on. Um, and in terms of monitoring, Solar provides JMX. It's done that for forever. Uh, but the problem with JMX is it only gives you a snapshot of uh, at any given instant. Uh, so if you want information about what's going on in my system right now, yes, you'll get that through JMX. But if you want to have a comparative analysis of, oh, is my QPS going up? Is my updates per second going up? Or is my errors going low? Or my you know, OAMs or heap memory usage going up or down? Uh, JMX cannot help you with that because it, it has no state. And that's the reason why uh, Sora recently added metrics. So you can have metrics and um, you can have them, I'm forgetting what it was, but uh, you, can, you can create um, plugins that would then j use these metrics and write them to external data sources. And you can write, I think there's support for a couple right now. And uh, it's easy to extend that and add support to more uh, third party monitoring systems. So Solar can push out these metrics that would have stateful information. And then you can visualize this, do whatever you want to do with this. So um, now that we are done with that part, which is kind of the basics, but important as, as, as important, uh, what's the plan to scale? More often than not, I've seen people think about scale in terms of uh, two dimensions, right? I mean, traffic and data. Oh, we support two terabytes of index right now. We're going to be supporting 20 terabytes by next year. OK, and we support uh, 500 QPS right now, per instance. We're going to be able to support 5,000 next year. That's good. There's an important component there, which is features. And that's a discussion that uh, people who are building search platforms generally are having in parallel rather than having it in, you know, together with the entire traffic and data scaling models. One thing that people tend to forget is the new features that they add are going to have a serious impact on how the system behaves. So let's say you planned uh, that you're, you know, by the end of the year, you're going to be supporting x terabytes of data some certain amount of QPS and updates per second. And um, you're like, OK, our current hardware can handle that. Uh, and you plan only for that. But then you add a feature that kind of bloats up your index by 10 times. So you do that, and you make it super easy for the end user. So all they need to do is click on something. It re-indexes data and bloats everything 10x. So you've totally forgot that, kept that out of the equation, because the team that was probably working on building the feature did not work with the team that was responsible for scaling hardware. 
So when you think about scaling, think about how the features are going to work with your data and traffic. The interesting thing, um, and I've had I've faced challenges with this at multiple organizations I've worked with. It's a very common thing. How do you manage versions and upgrades? So the users don't want to change much. You want to change a bunch in the back end, or a few users actually want features from the new version or release of the the search platform, uh, the search project that you use, say Solar. And what do you do in that case? You ideally dream that uh, you know, the entire platform runs a single version. It should be easy and clean. Everyone runs on that same version. Doesn't work that way. Trust me, like, um, as much as you may try, that thing doesn't, that doesn't work. You can appeal as much. You can escalate as much. You can tell them you're going to block their request at some point. It's hard. They, they generally wouldn't listen to you. So what do you, what do, you do in that case, right? So um, building a proxy in the middle, that's the best thing. As I said, it helps you with managing throttling and a bunch of other things, uh, access restrictions. Proxy is the answer to most problems when it comes to search. And that's something that you need to think about when you're starting off with your search platform thing. Like, you can't expose the actual solar endpoint when you're thinking about building a platform. Proxy is super important when you look at this. So, um, and what the proxy would let you do is uh, keep the back end totally transparent from the, the end user. So the end user uses a client API that stays consistent, is backward compatible, and is owned by you. Um, you can keep on adding to it in a manner that is backward compatible. Now, while Solar or Elasticsearch breaks compatibility, does a, a bunch of other stuff, you can just map things in your proxy layer and continue for, you know, continuously make things work for the end user without them having to actually upgrade until they really want to. Like, if they really want to use a new feature, then yes, give them a new client, let them use it. But all your clients would be backward compatible as far as, you know, end users go. So it would let you upgrade and also roll back if things don't work out. Don't do that often, though. Uh, bad idea. Um, and another interesting thing that you would want to do here is um, log the uh, So when you build your client, add a version to the client and make sure that you're logging the version of the client requests that come in. The interesting thing that happens when you do that is um, when, when you want to upgrade, say, your middle tier, your proxies, deprecate something, not deprecate, but actually remove support for something, you can be guaranteed if you're logging the version of the client requests that are coming in and you see that, oh, for the last three months, nobody has actually used the older version of the client, that's a safe point for you to just roll up and say, okay, we're done with supporting two versions or three versions in a proxy layer. And that makes things super easy for you to you know, figure out in terms of this is a good time to move on. Well, what about backups? Because things don't go as planned always, right? Um, I saw, I recently saw an XKCD uh, strip that I, I tried hard to find to put it here on my slide, but I couldn't. Um, and it was all about how uh, there's this engineer who says, "I think we should have a backup system." And so he goes to his manager, who goes to his manager, who goes to the C the CTO, who says, "Okay, let's talk to the CFO because we need money for the machines that are going to run the backup systems." Like, okay, so it goes to the back to the CFO, and the CFO says, "Okay, how much money do you need?" He puts up a number there, and the CFO is like, "Oh, really? Uh, that's a lot of money. We could host 500 new users on that. Why do you need a backup? Have we ever needed a backup in the last one year?" It's like, "No, not really." It's like, "Well, then why do we need one now?" They don't take the backup. And that was the last time that conversation happened. After that, they didn't ever speak because disaster struck. So backups are important. So a good question to ask there is, though, how often do you want to backup? You don't want to really, yes, you might have a nice, friendly CFO or whoever it is that approves the budget for getting your backup systems, backup hardware. You really don't want to just load it up and fill it up with stuff that you don't ever need. Most of us have a tendency of, let's just gather all the data that we have and not throw things away. Um, but don't do that. Um, backups in Solar Cloud are also expensive. They, didn't, uh, they weren't offered until recently. Newer versions have backups, so that's a, uh, that's a good thing. Um, plan around cleaning up your backups. One of the organizations I've worked with, um, we realized that our backup systems were filling up, so somebody proactively decided I'm going to write a script that's going to go ahead and clean up my, my backup archive. Um, sadly, uh, 
the path went wrong, it ended up cleaning, um, and he used a wild card there, uh, it ended up cleaning the indexes of the disk. We didn't realize that things were going south until a host bounced. The host came up with nothing, because, well, there is no index, we cleaned it up. We have a ton of disk space, but we clean up the index. We still have the backups, though. Um, and when that happened, we were in a state where we were like, OK, now we have backups, thank God, which we can restore from. But we don't have real data. One, that's a customer message that we, we lost your data, at least from whenever we have our last backups from. And we had a whole fleet of systems running with nothing on disk. Um, all of the index, were, all of it was running because things were in memory. So until the JVM was alive, things would work. But as soon as it would go away, things would be dead. So yeah, we got some time. And the good part is we had backups. So we could kind of roll back, say, send a message saying, yes, we messed up. Um, and that's still a better position to be in. So all I'm trying to put forward here is get your backups in place, test your archive, archive cleaning scripts. Um, Test them out really well. Even better, back up into a directory that's not your index directory. Make sure that your cleanup script that cleans up your archives is not even touching your index directory. Your real data directory is, is holy. Like you just shouldn't be using third-party systems to play around with actual data that's lying around in that directory. Um, one more thing that you really want to do in distributed systems is you have collections, you have multiple shards. Uh, you need two things there. You need, you need a way to, one, make sure that you have backups uh, that are spread across everywhere. So you just need one copy. You don't really need 30 copies if, if that's your replication factor. Um, you also want to be sure that your backups are complete. You didn't pick up wrong segments from wrong hosts at wrong points in time, uh, especially if you're building your own backup system. So make sure. Both of these things work, which is one, you have a backup, and two, the backups are actually complete and not incomplete half and half backups. They'll not work together. Um, thanks to Varun, this slide got back in. I removed this slide. Um, you want to support auto re index. That's, um, that's a pretty interesting thing. Uh, most search engines who even come with it, tend to suggest that you disable it in production because it kind of adds in overhead, bloats up st the storage, a bunch of other stuff. Um, with solar, um, we generally say to not use solar as your primary data store. Like, never do this. Uh, you must have a pr another primary data so store and have search. But there might be times when you really don't want to seek out to your primary data store and want to just re-index. For that use case, if that's so important to you, you can support um, you know, uh, auto reindexing, uh, provide an endpoint, and if you have all of your data stored, you can just reindex. One thing to remember there is it's nice if you use aliases in such a situation, because then you can spin up a new collection, index all of your data again into that, and once you do that, you can point your alias to this newly created collection that's now that has now has doc values, or whatever uh, it is that you really wanted. And proxy, obviously, is a good place to manage such things in terms of pointing to the right collection, in terms of like the alias being, being the right thing. What, what are your plans about cluster security? Having done a bunch in Solar, um, the auth plugin and the auth framework, uh, it's interesting. And it's kind of important. You only realize it once you start talking to people who really care about security. So you, you'll get very diff different answers if you speak with a developer who's, who's, who's a search engineer, and you check with them, what do you think about security? It's like, why do you need security? It's behind a firewall. It works fine. It's just OK. Uh, you talk to the security experts like, oh, you've got these vulnerabilities here, here, and here. And this is, not this is completely wrong. This can never work. And how do you even store data there? That's so unsafe. So, very different sides of the story, depends on who you ask. Um, and um, Solar kind of offers a bunch of things, right? Uh, the authentication framework, the, uh, the authorization framework. You can build your own plugin. It comes with the Kerberos plugin support, uh, the basic auth. It kind of takes care of very gracefully and very well uh, when it talks through the internode Solar communication is perfect. Like, it works totally fine with TLS enabled and everything. But when you're working on like a search platform, uh, one thing that you really need to think about and worry about is 
those kind of interactions, right? Like the proxy to the cluster interaction is going to be a little different than a user to the proxy interaction. So you need to think about security in terms of how am I going to pass through my credentials when, it, when it's sent by the user through the proxy? Uh, think about encryption, logs, and backups, especially with GDPR. Like uh, you're pushing in data. Uh, Users are sending update requests. Maybe you're even logging each of those requests. So even though your solar index is completely safe and behind a firewall, whatever, if you're sending your logs to an unsecure host that has each of your update requests or each of your search requests, that's pretty much you could replay that thing to build, rebuild the index. So and on disk, uh, disk encryption. So think about all of these things. Think about auth plugins. And before you start off, just think about is there a way to do this using existing tools that Solar provides, or is there a way to just extend it and contribute it back instead of starting from scratch? GDPR. Um, the key, no, all of you who were at the keynote today, um, is the index data sensitive? Like That's an important question. That's, um, that's non-trivial. And as much as you might want to think and believe that it's like, oh, it's not such an important thing. It's OK. Like, there are other people who should be taking care of that. We don't have to worry about it. Uh, not always. So when you're building a source platform, think about who your audience is. Think about who your actual end users are and talk to Talk about that with your actual first level users. Like, talk to your users about who their users are and tell them what you can and ca cannot do. Can you obfuscate data? Because if, they, if there's social information, if there's information that's PII, if there's private, even personal information, um, you pr probably want to obfuscate a bunch of things logging, metrics, whatever it is that you store, send things away. So, think about that. And Think about if you should have access to data. That's an important thing. I mean, I, I, it's, a, it's a fairly common practice that the platform owners have access to every host. Um, shouldn't generally be the case, especially if you have data that's uh, PII. Uh, make sure that even uh, that, that, that data shouldn't be accessible to you. There should be tools for you to debug what's going on. There should be tools to get you obfuscated information back, um, but make sure that you're not uh, you know, you don't you don't have a way to get that data back. It's it's probably not going to end well. Well, now the advanced users, dear customers, have customer pl custom plugins, right? Um, that's that's what everyone thinks is like their magic trick. Like I've got a hat and things come out of it. Like it's it's uh, it's something that most of us believe we have something like that, and so. Everyone feels that their plugin is essential. Like they, they can't ever accomplish what they're trying to accomplish without that custom plugin. Think about what they're trying to do. If you, if you're in a setup where you can talk to the customers when they're getting on border, talk to them about do they really need it? Can they do it outside? Because one, one thing that you really should like remember is a code that does not belong to you. Uh, can have anything. And while it might come with test cases and a bunch of other things, there's no guarantee how it's going to work, especially on a multi-tenant system. Some person who built a plugin wrote a plugin in a manner that brings down the JVM that affects 20 other users. Um, that's a disaster. You really don't want that. So think about it. It's hard to maintain. It's worse when you want to upgrade, but the old user wants to stay on that version, and then you're trying to like fit the jigsaw pieces and say, OK, I'm going to move this user there and co-locate this user with this person. So don't do that. Think about a way where you, cannot, like, you can get around and not actually have custom plugins. It's a, it's a disaster to maintain. But if you really need to do that, if it's an advanced platform, then think about the Blob Store. It allows you to uh, actually upload a plugin, and Solar actually automatically distributes it. So it stores it. Uh, in a collection, a system collection, and then it goes ahead and distributes the jar, and you don't have to really copy and manage and maintain a bunch of stuff. So, but read about it, read about its security implications, and think about if you really want to support that plugin. Bless you. Um, how will you train users, right? Um, libraries, send them to libraries. Most of them will never end up there, right? I mean, uh, how many times have you read a manual, like? with anything that you bought. Microwave, for example. Nobody reads a manual. Um, 
So that's an often overlooked question. I build a platform, I bring it out, you try to use it. If you can't use it in the first 15 minutes, you're like, oh, the UI is crappy, I can't use this thing. Well, OK, I give you a UI that makes it easy for you to start, but 20 days later, when you're actually trying to do something constructive, you're like, oh, how do I do this? And how do I do that? And so they start pinging you, and you're like, I, sh I was supposed to build these interesting things for everyone, for like 50,000 users, and now I'm stuck with this one user trying to figure out this one specific use case that the last user asked for last month, but I can't share those emails, so what do I do, right? Think about demos, think about examples, think about, think about everything that can be uh, a generic thing and share it with everyone, set up mailing lists. Uh, make sure you share more and more information because you don't want to spend most of your time fixing things that have already been fixed. Telling people what's, uh, I mean, sharing information or typing an email that already exists. Like, if, if, it, if it has happened and if you've shared that information and it wasn't private information, it should be out there. You should just share it with, uh, in an archived system that is easy to search. So do that. And think about code examples. That's that's something that most people miss. Like they try to start writing code, or they try to write code, they know about the endpoints, they really don't know about how do I write code against it. Uh, they also, in case of Solar, there are five ways to do the same thing, right? So it'd be nice for someone to understand what are the differences between those five ways. Uh, if your platform only exposes one way of those five ways of doing things, tell them why, write it down, share it with them. It makes things much easier for a user. And if your users are kind of happy and uh, you know, uh, things work for them, it's going to be super awesome for you. Oh, and one more thing. Uh, do you plan to fork? Because a bunch of times you're like, oh, I need, uh, I need this and I need that. I've seen people uh, fork because they were running a multi-tenant setup with a bunch of cores. Um, they realized they were logging way too much information um, because Solar was logging way too much information. And they decided to fork only because they wanted to comment out the log lines, right? So yes, no. Uh, that's a disaster. And then when you try to upgrade to another version, what are you going to do? Are you going to go back again through those, I don't know, I removed that slide, but uh, 154 years of effort has gone into just solar itself. Are you going to go through every bit of line and figure out all the log lines and figure out if it's important to you the next time you want to upgrade? Because this cannot be backported or forward ported. Like that, it doesn't work that way. So if you're trying to fork, reason it out. Think about do you really want it? Do you really need it? If you don't need it, first thing, just if you don't need it, don't do it. If you really need it, can that be a plugin? If that can be a plugin, can that be contributed? That's a very good thing. Like you don't want to maintain your own plugin for the rest of your life. There, are, there's a community around it. Uh, there it would be super. We would be super happy to add more things, more tests, test it out, try it out, uh, and that would make things much better as opposed to forking out and doing things your way. Like, so please, don't fork. Chopsticks. Um, summary. Keep it simple. Think about the users. Um, think about who you're targeting, and then stick around with that. Don't try to expand and like support advanced users, basic users, people wanting to do machine learning, and people wanting to do a bunch of other stuff. It's like no, like concentrate on one aspect. If you have a, advanced users, and if you're only building it for like at one of my organizations that I work, worked at, we had six domains and six organizations within that who had five different use cases, 30 use cases, but six organizations within that. We kind of built custom things for them, but we knew these were the only people who would ever use it. it and it was internal, so you can do that kind of stuff. Uh, just, just make sure you're targeting the right audience and picking, the, uh, you know, don't bite off more than you can chew. Uh, we tend to like always get super excited about I'm going to do this, this, and this. Uh, I've been facing that uh, for a long time now. Um, you want to do a lot, but you cannot accomplish most of it, and kind of gets frustrating every now and then. So don't do that. Um, also, in terms of the version and up the upgrades, we have a pretty active uh, release cycle, like a uh, month. Every month, we have releases. And I'm not even talking about bug fix releases. I'm talking about new features coming out, yay. Um, 
pick up a stable version. I would not recommend like the version that would come out five days from now. Don't don't just and I'm I'm not I'm not categorically speaking about that version. I just mean don't pick up the most recent version. Pick up a version that's been out there for a few months. People have tried it out. Test that out. See that works for you, and then stick with it. Like don't try to backport most of the stuff. Like if you don't really need it, and the next time you really want to pick up a bunch of things, uh, just go ahead and uh, upgrade. Don't try to backport. That's a, that's a rabbit hole. Like, once you start, start there, there's no coming back. And that's it for the conference and from me. Thank you.